chapter into uh, three, three, three weeks, three studies, the first 28 verses tonight, just kind of call it the king's return, part one, two, and three, and um, we can look forward to the king's return soon, and so we won't have to worry about whether we're going to grow to be 100 or not, I think as, the, as, as Charlie was just saying, not necessarily a good idea. We all seem to be very excited about it, but um, he's not sure if he is. <laughs> all right. So anyway, this is the, uh, referred to also as the uh, Olivet Discourse, uh, where we ended last week was Jesus' uh, last, basically, public message which, uh, uh, in which he was kind of railing against the Pharisees, the Pharisees in particular that were the, uh, made up of the Sanhedrin, uh, again, we, well respected by, uh, by the people and so forth, uh, and uh, interesting, uh, again, from our message on Sunday, uh, just to note that uh, many of them came to faith in Christ after the de death and resurrection, as well as several priests, many priests, uh, and so forth. We'll, uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about, uh, uh, about uh, again, the 70 A.D. destruction, about how many uh, Jewish believers there were in Jerusalem at that time uh, as uh, we get to that portion tonight. Uh, I would just uh, encourage you with all this going on in Israel and the Middle East in general, uh, to certainly continue to pray pray for uh, Israel. They, uh, I was just listening to, I, I posted a portion of an uh, interview with Benjamin Netanyahu on our Facebook today where he was talking about the fact that they, they've opened a field hospital uh, for the Palestinians uh, right uh, uh, in the northern part of, uh, of Gaza to try, try to help the best they can. Uh, but Hamas will not allow any of them to come to the hospital. Uh, at the same time, uh, they are putting their rocket launchers on tops of hospitals and the roofs of hospitals, which then they, Israel has to try to, again, they drop leaflets, they send texts, they call, and they try to allow for evacuation. Uh, but if they're going to launch from, from the hospitals, uh, they finally had to go after and, uh, and bomb one yesterday because their, their own guys in the streets were, were getting killed and, you know, trying to move through the streets and... Uh, and find the tunnels and so forth. This, this all came about, uh, in a sense, by uh, when Morsi took over Egypt. Morsi takes over Egypt. He's a Muslim Brotherhood. He's tied in directly with Iran. Uh, and basically, he opened the border from Egypt uh, into the Gaza Strip uh, to the tunnels that were there. Now, the tunnels from Egypt into Israel are tunnels like the size of the Leaky Leaky Tunnel. So we, we talk tunnel. We're not talking about a couple of guys crawling through, you know, some, you know, digging with their bare hands kind of thing. We're talking tunnels, like go through a mountain kind of tunnel that you drive heavy equipment and trucks through. Uh, so during that time period before al-Sisi, the current president who was the military leader of the country, took over during that time period, uh, that's where all these advanced uh, missiles and weapons came from, uh, from Iran uh, uh, via Egypt in through that border. At the same time, uh, Israel was pushing hard to ban all import of cement uh, into the country during, during that time. And the reason they were trying to do that is because they knew they weren't bringing in all this cement to build buildings. They were, they were bringing it in to build tunnels. Uh, if you've seen videos, uh, have you seen some of the videos or pictures of, of the tunnels? No? Oh, they're, again, they're heavily reinforced and they're not little in other words, it's full cement and cement all the way across the top, lit all the way. They're, they're sophisticated tunnels. Uh, all of the money and funds that have been pouring into Gaza uh, for humanitarian aid to build kindergartens uh, instead have been, use, been using to build tunnels, dozens of tunnels, uh, of tunnels uh, so that the Hamas could sneak into Israel and steal kids, kidnap kids out of their kindergarten and the kibbutzes and and bring them back uh, so that they could hold them hostage, uh, so that they could uh, uh, seek to free, uh, free prisoners. If you recall, the last time uh, there was a prisoner swap to get um, Gilad Shilat, who was an Israeli soldier that was kidnapped, held in captivity for five years by Hamas. In order to get him free, they had to release 1,000 Palestinian prisoners in order to get the one Israeli back. Um, whether that was a good idea, and they should have done that or not, but uh, they did, and uh, as a result, now they're, that's the idea. Build tunnels, kidnap uh, Israelis, 
uh, and then we'll free all of the rest of the terrorists that they've been holding and so forth. So it's, um, it's interesting. It, um, and it's interesting even to watch the news and, and see how they kind of frame the story that's, uh, that's going on. Israel's trying to do all they can to prevent uh, any civilian deaths. Hamas is trying to cause civilian deaths, but uh, Israel, of course, gets blamed. But um, uh, we have that going on, and then we've got the uh, story out of Mosul, where the ISIS, uh, the is Islamic State of, uh, of uh, Syria and Iraq, have now gone into the uh, community of Mosul. Mosul, uh, the Christians there uh, date their uh, the history uh, back ver- very early on. They were there hundreds of years before there was ever before Islam even came into being. Uh, and now they're, they're having to flee. Their homes were painted, painted with an inn for Nazarene. Uh, and they were given 72 hours to evacuate, convert, or be killed. Uh, they loaded up what they could. They got in their trucks and their cars, and they drove then towards the border. When they got to the border, then they were stopped. Every piece of luggage, every piece of possession, every piece of jewelry was taken from them. Literally, the only thing they allowed them to leave with with the clothes on their back, uh, and they were leaving, uh, leaving by the thousands to try to get out of uh, Mosul in, in, uh, in time. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, there were 1.5 million Christians uh, in Iraq, and today there's less than uh, 500,000. A million have been killed or fled the, the country in the last 10 years. So uh, anyway, that's uh, another story certainly to, to follow in the Middle East and, uh, and pray for those Christians that are uh, fleeing that, uh, that area. But anyway, I'll try to post a few more things on Facebook as we go along. All right. Well, out of it, discourse. Well, uh, again, uh, uh, the, the disciples ask three different questions in regards to what we might call end times uh, about uh, Jesus has made the remark. He will make the remark uh, as they walk by the temple. Again, it's Passover. Uh, it's a full moon. Uh, the temple is, uh, this is Solomon's, or Herod's temple, it's uh, 10 stories, it's white marble, it's gold-plated uh, in terms of the doors and so forth. Uh, it would be quite a spectacle uh, in the full moonlight as they were leaving Jerusalem uh, and crossing the Kidron Valley. And Jesus makes the remark that, and not one stone will be left uh, on this temple together. And they want to know about that. When, that. when will that happen? What will be the sign be? Uh, what would be the time, uh, how will we know when the end of the age is coming? Uh, and Jesus answers uh, these questions. Again, first they wanted to know when. It's not recorded, that answer, in Matthew's gospel, but it is in Luke's gospel, Luke twenty-one twenty. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Uh, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So uh, that's one of the questions. Uh, when, when will it happen? He said, and he, he makes reference to Jerusalem being surrounded by uh, armies. Then know that desolation uh, is near. Second, they asked uh, about the sign of Christ's return. That was part of that, that question. Uh, verse 8 gives a very key little phrase. Uh, it will happen. Uh, there'll be circumstances or signs. We'll look at them in uh, detail. I'll enumerate them very easily for you. Uh, but a key phrase is in verse 8. Uh, when these things happen, these are the beginning of sorrows or birth pains. Uh, so there's going to be, uh, before Christ's return, circumstances that occur here on the earth. And they will be like birth pains. In other words, when a woman goes into labor, uh, those birth pains will uh, as time goes on, get closer and closer together, uh, and they will increase uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the magnitude of what's happening. Uh, and that will be the same for these circumstances that uh, uh, Jesus makes reference in the text too. Uh, that would ultimately bring them to uh, lead up to the sign of his second coming, uh, which he mentions in verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, uh, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, great glory. I just always get that mixed up a little bit there. Uh, so that, that's the third question. So these things will all get uh, addressed. Again, uh, to keep in mind the atmosphere of the whole discourse is very Jewish. Jesus talked about Judea. He t- talks about the Sabbath. 
and he talks about the prophecies uh, of Daniel uh, uh, in terms of Daniel chapter 9. So the sign of Christ's return to planet Earth uh, will be up here in heaven. Uh, everybody will mourn. Everyone will see that Jesus is coming. Uh, so what are the signs of his coming? So when you talk about coming here, again, he's talking, we're talking in Revelation 19. We're talking about his coming to uh, defeat uh, the armies of the Antichrist and to establish his kingdom. The question of his coming for the church and the rapture will actually get to later in the text uh, uh, two weeks from tonight. Uh, so the first thing, the signs of the, of the coming, the signs of the coming sign, uh, verse 1 to 14. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? There's the three questions. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, again, or of birth pains. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. Uh, and then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So again, Jesus gives us uh, the signs that lead up to the sign as far as him appearing in the air coming uh, at, the, at the end. Uh, again, described as the beginning of sorrows or the beginnings of, uh, of birth pains. And uh, what I've done is I, I've grouped these together in six different circumstances to look at. Uh, and the first one, the first sign, is religious counterfeits. That's in verse 4 and 5. So Israel will be, sa be deceived. Uh, the Jews have often certainly been led astray by false prophets and false Christ. Uh, in Revelation 6, the rider on the white horse is actually the Antichrist, the final world dictator. He will come on the scene and lead all the nations of the world astray. They will see him as, again, anti means against, but it also means like. He will show up and be like a Messiah. He will show up and be like Christ. He will show up and be a great uh, political leader. He'll be a great statesman. Uh, he'll be able to solve the problems that we're talking about. How do we end all of this fighting that seems like there's no uh, end to it uh, in the Middle East? Uh, how can the Palestinians and, uh, and Israel finally live side by side? Uh, the things that uh, no one has been able to figure out, he'll be able to figure out. He'll be hailed as a great hero, but he will be the great deceiver. Even come riding on a white horse is the, the image or the uh, type of, uh, that were given there in Revelation. Uh, it also says that everyone can be deceived. The deception was, uh, is widespread. Take heed that no one deceives you. Notice verse 5, for many will come in my name. Not a few, but many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Again, are people being uh, dece deceived today? Well, I, would, I think that they are. And uh, I think that uh, uh, you don't have to... Um, you don't have to do a lot of reading uh, to, uh, and uh, just take a lot of observation <laughs> to, to find out that people aren't quite as astute spiritually as they were once time, uh, at one time. Again, the way we prevent deception is by knowing the Word of God. Here's the truth, and we use that as the measuring line to measure other things by. People simply just do not, uh, even that call themselves Christians, uh, really don't have the... the uh, wherewithal to actually do that uh, any longer for the most part. One survey taken by a Christian magazine said that 90% of Christians in this country, for example, do not believe that the state of Israel is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. 90%. <laughs> Wrong. 
But uh, again, uh, we've had uh, certainly a number of false uh, messiahs uh, come on the scene. And, you know, the Jim Jones, the Branch Davidians, the Heaven's Gates. And uh, there was a, a group back a while called the Raelians. Uh, they said that uh, uh, Rael claimed to be the half-brother of Jesus and, and the son of a woman uh, and an alien. Uh, anyway, uh, it, you can't make this stuff up. But people were following these guys and willing to uh, die with them uh, and buy for them. I think one of the biggest false uh, Messiah messages today uh, is to believe that you're the Christ, or at least you have the Christ consciousness that you can tap into. False Messiahs will come, and this is at the heart of the New Age m movement, that if you just recognize that within you, and sometimes they actually use that term, Christ consciousness, other times they use other terms, but they mean the same thing, uh, but uh, there's a tremendous uh, deception uh, going on. A good example with that would be the popularity of one of their chief spokesmen, a woman named Oprah Winfrey. Has anybody ever heard of her before? I, I think you might have, uh, maybe a few people have heard of her before. Uh, claims to be a Christian. Uh, she's advocated New Age theology for quite uh, some time. Uh, she says that, I believe God is in all things, which makes her pan panantheism. Uh, she also is a which means, again, that's the force. The force is in everything. You know, so that's uh, kind of, uh, if, if you're familiar with Star Wars, you kind of understand Buddhism a little bit anyway, uh, but the idea of panentheism. So she, uh, she believes that. Uh, she also uh, believes in uh, pantheism uh, because she believes that there are many, many gods. Um, she said, quote, one of the mistakes that human beings uh, make is believing that there is only one way. Uh, there are many paths to what you call God. Uh, she also said, I am a Christian who believes that there are certainly many more paths to God other than Christianity. I think that makes you a non-Christian then. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm just say saying, um, uh, she is uh, incredibly uh, popular. Uh, it's certainly great, uh, uh, you know, very successful uh, financially and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then the books that she's promoted while she was still uh, on, on the air before she started her, uh, her own television network. Uh, one of those books was called The Secret by Rhonda Brine, uh, again, which was a, uh, a classic uh, New Age uh, book. Uh, another book called A New Earth, Awakening uh, to Your Life's Purpose by Eckhart Tolle. Again, espouses that we're all one. God is all one. We're all part of each other and so forth this idea of panentheism, and I could go on and on. So her, you don't have to listen too long to her, though. It's not like she talks about it on every show and every time she's interviewed. But anytime she talks about spirituality, uh, she's pretty straight out there and forward that she believes she can hold to and call herself a Christian and yet be deeply involved uh, in, the, in the New Age. And one of these books, a secret book, and it's, it's literally witchcraft uh, in, the, in the book and so forth. And, uh, and she is accepted by thousands of, you know, we might say millions of people as being somebody that they look up to spiritually. Uh, do we live in a day uh, of great deception? I think we live in a day of, uh, of great deception. We keep from being deceived by, by knowing uh, the word of God, by taking the Bible and making it the screen that we kind of filter everything through. Uh, so we know whether it's really uh, true or not. Again, uh, later in uh, this chapter in verse 24, where false pri uh, Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, uh, even the elect. So the deception is going to be one of the signs that it's like birth pains. Uh, they're around, uh, and it's going to uh, increase. Uh, and the level at which they are effective will uh, increase as well. Uh, and in the end, uh, they will be able to show great signs uh, and wonders. Uh, and that's enough for some people. It would have been enough for me one time, not knowing the word of God, uh, not having given my life to the Lord, but looking at spiritual things. If somebody could do a sign and wonder, and uh, uh, they seemed like a pretty good person, that was validation enough for me that they're probably from God. If they say they're from God and they can do a miracle, they must be from God. I assume that's not really true. Uh, Satan's pretty powerful, uh, and he is the ultimate deceiver. And, uh, and of course, during that last tribulation period, uh, you'll have this unholy trinity of the Antichrist, the false, uh, the false prophet, 
and uh, uh, that will, uh, and then these three orchestrating together, uh, doing signs uh, and wonders. Again, a political leader, a religious leader, uh, and then uh, Satan infusing them uh, to deceive many. Uh, secondly, there'll be uh, the other sign: uh, a political and military conflicts. Uh, again, uh, Jesus says wars are not a sign of the end times. Uh, there's always been war, wars. There always will be. Uh, we're told now that uh, at any one time throughout history, there's been about 40 wars uh, taking place on planet Earth. But these are very different wars. These are nation against nation. Actually, it's speaking of ethnic groups fighting other ethnic groups. Uh, and that certainly we've seen an increase in those things. But also it says kingdom against kingdom. So this indicates world governments would be fighting other world governments. And, uh, and that these world governments fighting other world governments somehow would have something to do uh, with the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. There'd be some tie there. Again, it's a Jewish context. Uh, well, this did not happen until early in the 20th century. In June of 1914, the Archduke of Australia, a Serbian zealot, shot uh, Prince Ferdinand. Uh, today, UN peacekeepers are still trying to keep those two ethnic groups of people apart and keep them from killing each other, the Serbs and the Croatians. Uh, that battle then ensued because of his being, uh, Prince Ferdinand being shot, is known as the Great War. It involved 53 million soldiers. Over 13 million of them were killed, not counting the civilians killed on both sides. Later, because we had another war similar to it, we had to start calling that World War I as opposed to the Great War. Did it involve Israel? Yes, during that time, the British uh, were finally able to drive out the Ottoman Empire basically from the Middle East. Uh, and the reason that, uh, uh, again, one of the things that, that they did at that point in time, then the League of Nations met, uh, and after struggling with the concept for 100 years or so, uh, uh, basically came to the conclusion that we have to make a homeland for the Jewish people. And, um, and so what they did is uh, Great Britain went into the Middle East, and they drew a map <laughs> wherever they wanted. They made lines. And they sliced and, uh, and diced. That's why in Iraq, you, you've got these three different groups of people. You've got the Kurds, you've got the Sunnis, and you've got the Shiites. But they're all supposed to be part of one country. Why? Because 100 years ago, Great Britain said, draw on the line here. You're now countrymen. You're in one country. That, that's how the, the map of the Middle East came about. And when they drew up the map for Israel, they drew present-day Israel, the whole thing, and also what we'd call present-day Jordan. And they drew that whole thing, Jordan in the middle. They said, that's Palestine, that's Israel's homeland. And the League of Nations voted and certified that was the Jewish people's homeland. Unfortunately, though, uh, there were those in the, the equivalent of the State Department uh, of Great Britain, I think it's called the Foreign Affairs Office, uh, that uh, were pretty anti-Semitic. Uh, they didn't think it was a good idea to give the Jews that much land. So they sliced it down and said they're going to give them the sliver that we know as Israel today. And they said, if we give this over uh, and we create a government over here, we can call it Jordan because it's on the other side of the Jordan River. There was no country there before. We'll just say there's a country there. We can appoint someone to be the king, the Hashemite kingdom. We'll appoint our guy. He'll be in charge. And then we can control what goes on in this part of the Middle East. That's, and that's what Great Britain did. So Israel lost the homeland they thought they were going to get. It got whittled down to the little slice that they have not now. Anyway, this went through a, uh, Great Britain's whole thing was they had troops all over the Middle East, and if they could appoint who would rule in these areas, they, they could control the whole Middle East, control the oil and everything else. That was as a result of World War I uh, or, the, or the Great War. Of course, then Great Britain reneged on those promises. Uh, the League of Nations fell apart at the outbreak of World War II. Israel was never given their land, even the little slice uh, on the edge of the Mediterranean. But again, Jesus says, you'll know one of the signs will be false teachings, false uh, religions, false messiahs uh, will be increasing, and you'll have wars. Not just wars, but kingdom wars, world powers against each other, 
and they have to have something to do with Israel, and certainly World War I uh, meets that criteria. Then there was the, the sign of World War II. Again, 1939 to 1945, the vast majority of the world's nations were, uh, were involved. Uh, the numbers here are just, uh, just staggering. 100 million people were serving in military units from 30 different countries. 100 million. Uh, it was, it was uh, amazing. Uh, including the Holocaust and the use of a nuclear weapon, 50 to 75 million people died. Uh, these deaths make World War II by far the deadliest conflict in human history. Did it impact the Jews? Abs absolutely. Uh, because of the Holocaust and the killing of six million uh, Jews, again, that relates to Great Britain as well. Great Britain, when they decided to not let Israel have their homeland, appointed what was, who was called the Great Mufti, an Islamic Iman ruler over Jerusalem, gave him complete power. He sides with Hitler in the Third Reich. He is the one that is leading the charge to purge Europe of all Jewry altogether. Even when Jews from Hungary and other places were, uh, were being gathered up to take to uh, no other parts of, uh, of Europe because they weren't involved in the conflict, the Mufi goes to Berlin, talks to Hitler, and convinces him to send thousands of them, all of them, also to the death camps uh, in, uh, in, in Poland, the Grand Mufti. Uh, uh, he, he becomes the father figure of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Islamic Jihad, and others that we have in the Middle East. Thank you, Great Britain. But, uh, and this, uh, it, it's a sad story that continues uh, in terms of the betrayal of the, of the Jewish people. But certainly... Uh, World War II uh, definitely impacts the Jews because of the remorse over what happened in the Holocaust. Then uh, the United Nations, as a new organization, replacing the League of Nations, then does give uh, the Jews their homeland there in 1948. Of course, they are immediately attacked by all of their neighbors. But again, uh, our point here is, are these signs there? And they were never there until... Uh, the beginning of the last century, uh, through la the last century, uh, these kind of signs are there. And, and that's the concern today. Uh, China's building their weapons. They're building a blue, uh, a blue water navy. Uh, you've got uh, Putin. Uh, he's spreading his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, influence uh, in military as quick as he can around uh, uh, the eastern Baltic countries. And, and we could be setting ourselves up for a ma another major conflict. We knew to know from Ezekiel that eventually uh, Russia with Iran, several other nations will move against Israel. But Jesus says um, it's not just the wars. There's always wars. But when you have kingdom kinds of wars, uh, then you might know my return uh, is near. Uh, third, physical conditions will deteriorate. Uh, after World War I, there's a flu epidemic that hits in 1918. It spreads through Europe, Canada, the United States. More people died from the flu than in the war. Uh, amazing. According to the CDC, Center for Disease Control, in 1950, there were, for, these are again just four examples, uh, two known sexually transmitted diseases that were considered to be epidemic. 1950, there were two. Uh, in 1980, there were 57. In 1990, there were 86. And um, uh, these statistics are from about a year ago. Currently, there are 65 million people who have STDs in this country, uh, 15 mi uh, million new cases every year. So this was a year ago, so about 80 million. Uh, there are currently eight that are considered to be out of control and no cure, and they are an epidemic. And we could go on with the, you know, again, these, these things that Jesus warned us about that would go out of control uh, in the end times. Earthquakes help create famines and uh, both help to cause epidemics uh, that take uh, many lives. Uh, the U.S. Geological Surveys uh, had said about a year ago or so that 75 million Americans in 39 states are at risk for earthquake hazards. And uh, it seems like uh, weekly, uh, but it's actually by the hour, you can go on the uh, U.S. Geological site and watch, watch the earthquake reporting going. There's just something constantly uh, all over the world. Uh, but again, uh, in terms of magnitude, uh, we've certainly seen some, some big ones recently. 
uh, including the one in, in Japan uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, there was one in Southeast uh, Alaska, 7.5, uh, many of them over 6.9, uh, 8.0 in the Santa Cruz Islands and, uh, and so forth. And I've got a lot of statistics. We won't go through them all. Let's just say there's a lot of disease going around and there's a lot of earthquake going around. Uh, the very things that Jesus talked about, he says they're like birth pangs. They are going to increase. They're going to get closer together. Uh, and uh, in terms of, uh, of the uh, impact they're making, that will increase as well as the time grows near. Again, is it not just one thing we're looking for? It's several. The fourth one is there'll be constant persecution uh, of the Jewish people. See that in verse 9? Then they will deliver you up. Again, uh, specific to uh, the Jewish people. In other words, there'll be an acceleration as we head towards this time of persecution and murders, and apparently all nations will be involved. And, um, and certainly we've seen that. We mentioned um, uh, Christians and Christian persecution has uh, increased uh, tremendously, but um, uh, the persecution of Jews around the world and anti-Semitism is growing at a, uh, an incredible rate. When the KGB files were opened up after the Cold War, the world was shocked to find out that it was worse than they could have imagined. Under the reign of Joseph Stalin, he killed 30 million Jews and Christians. And we think about Hitler and how terrible he was because he killed 6 million. He killed 30 million uh, Jews and Christians uh, during his particular uh, reign. And... Um, uh, uh, a new ministry partnership had launched a campaign to raise awareness of the fact that there's an estimated 176,000 Christians around the world who are uh, martyred, uh, killed for their faith uh, in a one-year period uh, in just about a year ago. And I actually heard uh, a report because of what's going on in Mosul. I heard uh, on, on Fox, on, on Kelly, a file. She was talking and, and quoting some statistics that uh, this number has increased uh, dramatically, that uh, last year there were more people martyred for their faith uh, than uh, any other time in history. But again, this is specific uh, to the Jewish people here, uh, the concern. Uh, when we had uh, Dr. Thomas Ice with us a few years ago, uh, he did a, a whole uh, uh, presentation on a Sunday morning on what he referred to as the new anti-Semitism, which of course is against Israel. And, and we're seeing it. Uh, just. If you want to know how bad it is, again, uh, understand what really is going on in Israel and what they're up against, and then watch CNN or watch CBS, uh, and you're going to see uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, you're going to see that this is what Israel is doing. No, they've been being attacked since 2005. They were getting hundreds of rockets shot at them, uh, and their people are living in bomb shelters, uh, and uh, they can't get any cooperation to close the borders off to Gaza and so forth. They finally have to, to go in. They wait until they've been, had a 1,000 rockets shot at them this year. A anyway, you'll, you'll, see, you'll hear, and you'll hear a very different language uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, the new anti-Semitism from an article by uh, uh, Awitz Sheva, uh, who is writing about Odessa, we're... we're, we're uh, Odessa is in the Ukraine, and um, uh, again, that's in the news a lot, of course, uh, with the shoot down of the Malaysian airliner. Those guys that shot it down using those Russian weapons are very anti-Semitic, and one of the things that they're doing in eastern Ukraine is trying to drive every Jewish person uh, out of that part of the Ukraine. Uh, this article says the Jewish community of the southern Ukrainian city of Odessa is prepared for mass evacuation should violence re-erupt there, according to a Monday report by the Russian Today. Uh, a Holocaust memorial to more than 25,000 Odessa Jews uh, massacred under Nazi occupation was decimated, desecrated in mid-April, along with a Jewish cemetery as an unidentified attackers painted them in swastikas, death threats against Jews uh, and uh, radical right sector uh, symbols anti-Semitism in Ukraine also made the headlines last month after masked people in, in uh, Donetsk disturb, uh, distributed leaflets uh, to all adults telling them if you're Jewish, as they were coming out of synagogue after Passover, you have to register and you have to register with, uh, with the government. Uh, and if you're not, then you'll be arrested. Uh, this is in a city where 25,000 of their 
family members were killed during, during the Holocaust. So there's, uh, you know, that's in the Ukraine. But uh, it's, it, it's all, over, uh, all over Europe. Uh, things have begun to, uh, to get worse. I think I've got a, a, few, a few slides just to pop through. Uh, again, so, you know, the, uh, it's just amazing that some of the things that takes place, even on college campus here uh, in the United States. So we refer to this as, uh, rather than say straight out, they're against the Jewish people, they straight out and say they're against the nation of Israel, which, by the way, is a <laughs> Jewish nation. I don't know if they put those two things together. You can go through the, the next couple of ones, Bonnie. So, uh, again, it's anti-Semitism is the hatred or persecution of, of the Jews. Uh, that's increasing. Uh, it's the um, uh, theory, action, or practice directed against the Jew. Uh, hence, uh, anti-Semite, one who is hostile, opposed to the Jews. That's the uh, Oxford Dictionary. Again, uh, rooted in past uh, anti-Semitism, the new anti-Semitism, rather than targeting individuals, uh, actually targets uh, the nation uh, it, uh, itself. Uh, in our own country here, uh, there was uh, uh, annually held in Manhattan uh, a uh, Israel Day Parade, uh, which takes place uh, every year on June 1st. Uh, this last year, uh, there were Jewish groups that registered that said that they promote the, the BDS. BDS is Boycott, Disinvestment, and Sanction Movement that targets uh, any companies that have anything to do with uh, Israel. John Deere gets targeted a lot. Uh, John Deere, uh, Israel, the Israeli government buys big John Deere tractors and bulldo bulldozers and so forth, and they, uh, they use it uh, over there. Uh, and some of them, they, they use almost like tanks when they're, when they're trying to go into places like Gaza. So because the Israeli buys from John Deere, uh, then other, uh, other groups like the Presbyterian USA Church uh, has decided that uh, in terms of their stock portfolio, they'll make sure that in their retirement portfolio for all their members and clergy and so forth, there are no companies that do business with Israel. In other words, we're going to boycott uh, the nation of Israel. Very anti-Semitic. So the boycott, disinvestment, and sanction group. So three of these groups sign up to, to march in the annual Israeli Day Parade in Manhattan. So they can be in the parade in protesting against uh, Israel. Again, saying, oh, we're not against Jews as individuals. We're just against them as a group or as a... Uh, uh, as a nation. Partners for uh, Progressive Israel list Israeli products to boycott on its website uh, and so forth. Uh, I don't know if you're, you're, you're aware of all this stuff that's going on. Uh, it's, ju it's just a way uh, for, for people. I, I think they're greatly misinformed. I don't think they've ever been to Israel. Uh, I don't think they, uh, they realize what uh, Israel is up against. You, you uh, keep hearing the phrase from Palestinians, um, uh, they refer to Israel as the occupiers. Occupy, it's, it's their land. It's been their land for thousands of years. They were driven out by the Muslims, uh, and, uh, and eventually they were able to retake it again. And I've kind of given you some of the dates on that in, in another, uh, at another time. But for example, the same thing happened to Spain. Uh, Spain, the Spanish people were driven out of Spain by the Muslims in the Ottoman Empire. It took them hundreds of years uh, to drive the Muslims back out. But nobody in Spain today is referred to as a occupier. Right? I mean, that would kind of... The Spanish soccer team, the occupiers, just won three to one. You didn't hear anybody say that at the World Cup. No, nobody said that. But uh, you hear this rhetoric uh, about Israel being the occupiers. Uh, that makes them sound bad, doesn't it? Uh, anyway, this is all part of the anti-Semitism. Now, Jesus said, when you see these things, these are all si signs of the sign, the sign Jesus coming back uh, in the heavens. These are all signs that would be uh, increasing. Five, there would be worldwide chaos. And then many will be offended, verse 10, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawless, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow uh, cold. So, uh, again, those who are once true to each other will betray each other. Is one way of, uh, of seeing this. Uh, this suggests a breakdown of marriages. 
of the homes uh, of nations that are being torn asunder for lack of loyalty. Lawless, lawlessness will ab abound. Uh, again, it will be difficult for law enforcement agencies uh, to even keep the peace. Well, I'm glad that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Sounds like we're, we're watching, listening to the, uh, uh, the evening news here. Uh, again, uh, sometimes we hear the reports about crime going down. I don't know if you're aware of this. How is it that crime could be going down in cities? Because they change the way crime is reported. <laughs> Things that were considered major crimes, we're going to put that in a different category so we don't have so many major crimes. But uh, uh, th things are getting worse. Uh, they're not getting better. I saw a, uh, I read and then saw a story in the news about this the other night that currently uh, there's a joint venture with uh, a major hospital in Chicago uh, with the United States Navy. And the purpose of it is, is to train uh, uh, Navy medics uh, and doctors uh, there uh, before they go to the field in Afghanistan or somewhere uh, because in Chicago there are people that come in this hospital every night with gunshot wounds. Chicago is, is, more da is considered to be statistically more dangerous than Baghdad. I don't know if you know, more people are killed by gunshots in Chicago uh, than, uh, than Bagram or you, any of the places in Afghanistan. There's a little war going, going over there uh, in a couple of places of, uh, of Chicago. Not the whole thing, but there's a couple of places where you don't want your car to break down. There's gangs that are fighting it out. So the, 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 uh, the Navy doctors are getting their prep and training so you know for uh, trauma for gunshots uh, in American city where it's really bad before they actually launch out uh, toward the war zone. Uh, conversely, some of them are coming back and working and helping them because of how much they're learning, of course, when they're uh, caring for our, uh, our own guys and so forth. Uh, but um, again, verse 13, but he who stands firm uh, to the end. Uh, again, uh, the end is the end of the age, uh, and that's our question. Number six, uh, there'll be a final sign before he comes. And uh, hallelujah, some good news here. Uh, worldwide preaching of the gospel. Uh, so that everyone, before Jesus returns back to planet Earth, the gospel is going to go out uh, to the whole world. Right now, there's 3,000 ethnic groups that do not have the scriptures. There are 15,000 people groups who have never heard the gospel. And, uh, and there are some exciting things going on as far as, uh, uh, as, far as uh, missions. I had a chance to um, uh, kind of spend the afternoon about uh, a couple of months ago with Danny Lehman, who kind of is at the heartbeat of all this uh, over at the uh, international headquarters there. It's YWAM at University of Nations and so forth. There are just some awesome things going on in terms of scripture translation, getting the gospel out into, into different places. And, and one of our guys that uh, is over there on the board that we support, uh, he's had a hand in, in helping get uh, uh, the scriptures to a group of people that have never had them in their language before uh, and has been in contact. Uh, uh, and I can tell you more where he is and stuff later, but uh, uh, had a hand in getting the manuscripts, getting them uh, printed in Thailand, uh, getting them uh, back out to them. Uh, there's some exciting things going on. Uh, there was a, a belief at one point in time within Christianity based on this verse is that uh, it, we, will, we will get the gospel out to the whole world. That's, our, that's what we need to be doing. And, and then as we do that and complete that, then Jesus would come back. So uh, we need to reach everyone and then Jesus will, uh, will return. Well, whether we get that done or not, God's going to make sure that it gets done. And of course, it was kind of popular uh, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, when there were missionaries been sent, sent out all over the place from Great Britain, from the United States. There were great things going on as far as, far as missions. It was really the belief that we would get it all done uh, in, in one of those generations and so forth. And then that Great War thing came along and kind of messed up that particular uh, uh, theology sometimes referred to as dominion theology. We Christians will dominate, will take over, uh, and then uh, will usher in the kingdom of God. But uh, it will get done by God. In Revelation 7, verses 1 to 8, uh, there we see that there's going to be 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from every tribe, uh, that will basically be, be evangelists. God will put his supernatural seal of protection upon them. 
during the tribulation period, and they will be out preaching the gospel uh, all around uh, the world. Uh, in Revelation 14, in case they miss somebody uh, along the way, it says that there, uh, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, uh, and springs of, of water. Uh, what's this angel doing? He's out there uh, preaching the everlasting gospel. <laughs> and I've heard people say, well, angel just means messenger. So these are giant radio towers that are going. No, I think it's an angel <laughs> that's, uh, uh, they, uh, that's going out and uh, literally doing this again to uh, if there are people groups or languages that haven't been reached on that day in heaven when you and I are all around the throne of God. The book of Revelation tells us there will be someone there from every tribe, language, and people gathered worship, worshiping God. So apparently this angel is going to get it done. We should be out getting the gospel out to every person we can, of course. But one of the indications at the end is that the gospel is going to get out to everyone, whether it's the 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams that are out there uh, or whether it's the, uh, the angel uh, at the end, uh, everyone is going to hear uh, the gospel at the end of the age. Again, it'll be a very difficult time period uh, by the time we get to the middle uh, of the tribulation period. Again, it's a seven-year period divided in the middle. By the time we get to the middle, half of the population of the earth has died. Uh, it'll be a horrific time to be on planet earth, but the gospel will be going out. So those are the signs, the signs of the coming sign. The sign is Jesus uh, returning, every eye will see him, not something done uh, secretly or in private. Uh, everyone will know exactly what's going on. They'll be mourning over it and so forth uh, by a group of people. But uh, there are signs that are like birth pains that will lead up to that one particular sign. All right, go quickly here. Last couple of verses. Prediction that leads to the sign uh, that will be seen by everyone. Uh, and there are three predictions here, verse 15 to 28. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies uh, in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east uh, and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So uh, the first thing we see is uh, uh, that he's mentioned is Daniel's prediction is completed. So the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, uh, seven-year uh, period, the church is removed prior to this event. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, talk about uh, uh, the restraining force that prevents the Antichrist from coming on the scene. And uh, again, I believe that restraining force is the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. I think sometimes uh, people say that with that very bad theology uh, and say that the Holy Spirit is going to be removed from the earth at that time. No, the Holy Spirit is God, uh, and He is omnipresent, and He is everywhere at once. Uh, so the Holy Spirit will still be at work here. There's going to be a great revival. People are going to be saved uh, during that tribulation period, but the church is going to be, uh, be removed. And... Uh, uh, and you can imagine what, uh, what the world would look like without the church. 
You can, we're in we're pretty kind of rough shape here in this country right now. But you can imagine if all the Christians who were, were removed from this country, uh, the, the continued direction that we would go in, uh, in now. Uh, the midpoint of the tribulation period is the, the most important. It's speaking again, uh, uh, Jesus quoting uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, abomination that causes des desolation. Notice it's, uh, it's a completely Jewish context again. Daniel 9, 24, seven weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. So this uh, sp abomination uh, causes desolation, talks about idolatry and immorality. Uh, and they're both speaking of one person, the Antichrist. Uh, again, he sets up a, an agreement with Israel for seven years that brings peace to their conflict that we're watching right now. Uh, part of that agreement allows them to rebuild uh, the, uh, the temple uh, up on the Temple Mount. And, uh, uh, and again, the, uh, the issue or the problem is the fact that the, uh, uh, the Dome of the Rock, which is uh, one of the, again, places of spiritual significance to, uh, to Islam. Uh, here's just a, a copy of a blueprint to show you how it could happen. Uh, again, this is a drawing of the Temple Mount. Uh, on the left, you have the Dome of the Rock. Uh, and you can see on the Temple Mount, there's plenty of room up there uh, for, for the temple. You can show the next slide. And that's what it will look like. How'd you get that picture? But uh, anyway, that's you, just to uh, show you that, that's, that's kind of what it will look like from the Mount of Olives. There's, there's plenty of room. Again, the Temple Mount is a huge area, uh, and there are plenty of room up there for uh, the temple itself. Now, Revelation 11.1 uh, there talks about uh, uh, this temple being rebuilt, and I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So uh, again, uh, that's exactly what will happen. The temple proper gets built, but not the outer court. It's been given to the Gentiles. Again, the Dome of the Rock, the al Ask Mosque uh, at, the other, uh, at the other end. Uh, but this all happens. Jesus says, Daniel was a prophet. What he said will happen. And during that tribulation period, in the middle, the abomination, the Antichrist, he sets up an image in that temple, then demands to be God brings life to the image, which is an image of himself that then can speak, uh, and the whole world will have to bow down and worship him uh, or, or lose their life uh, at, at that point. That's one of the predictions. The second prediction uh, is uh, a great confusion. Uh, and again, the prediction was for a future generation. Notice he says, whoever reads, let him understand. Uh, there's going to be confusion, Jesus says, over this whole area of prophecy. And there's a lot of people that don't teach on it, don't want to teach on it. And I have to tell you, there's, there's probably a good reason. It's not all good news in terms of what's going to be happening here uh, in the future. Uh, the church's view was uh, very much swayed by a man named Augustine. He gets saved in the late 4th century. Is a drunkard, womanizer. Mother prays for him. By the grace of God, he's saved. He becomes the great thinker and the great theologian of Roman Catholicism uh, and says that uh, we need to look at prophecy, not literally, but allegorically. It might say this, but it means this. It might say this and sound literal, but it really means this. And he's the guy that comes up with the idea of spiritualizing these texts uh, rather than seeing them literally uh, and it's affected people uh, in much of the church. Even today, it's what referred to, it leads to what we refer to as replacement theology. Now, before I continue, I just have to ask, are your heads spinning in circles with all this information? I, I, know, I know a lot of you, it's like, okay, keep going, because this is like, you know, this is my reminder of what I already know, and I need to get this all straight again. But uh, if you're hearing all this for the first time, I apologize, but... Um, um, I just trying to finish before the rapture is my goal. So that's what I'm trying to do. I still got two more sections, two more weeks to go here. I don't know if we'll make it. The third prediction was for uh, a current generation. Uh, now remember, the first question of the disciples concerned the time of the destruction of the temple. Uh, Matthew didn't cover the question, but uh, but Luke did, as we mentioned uh, earlier. 
uh, Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, uh, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let those who are in the country um, who are not in, uh, let not those who are in the country enter her. Uh, for these are the days of vengeance. And, uh, and of course, it, uh, it goes on a warning specific, specific to the Jewish people. So what happens is uh, the Christians are quite familiar with the Olivet Discourse. They've got the scroll of Matthew. They're quite familiar with what Jesus has said. Then, what's the warning? When you see the city surrounded. So then in 68 AD, there's a revolt of the Jews against the Romans uh, once again. Uh, a general named Cestus Gallus then laid siege to the city, surrounds the city. Uh, the people are reading the scroll of Matthew's gospel according to Jesus, and they're going, this is it. This is exactly what he's talking about. And Jesus said, when you see these things happening, you better flee. You better hope it's not in winter. You better hope it's not on the Sabbath. You better, and so forth. So they're thinking, we need to get out of town if we can get out of town. Cestus Gallus basically needs to get resupplied. He withdraws from the siege of the city for just a short period of time. He goes over to Caesarea, to the Mediterranean, where the ships are coming in to get his army uh, resupplied and re-equipped. Uh, when he does, he's killed. It takes Rome a while to get another general named Titus uh, set in motion and sail to get down there. In the interim, then, according to Josephus, over 100,000 Jewish believers fled because Jesus said to uh, in, the, in the Gospels here. Uh, and they went across the Jordan and basically got out of town. Uh, they went to uh, present-day Pella in Jordan, uh, and they waited for the prophecy of Jesus to be fulfilled. Titus marches back into the city then, late 68 A.D., uh, it takes them a couple years, 70 A.D., 1.1 million uh, Jews are killed into the city. Josephus describes it. It's a horrific event even before, because the people are starving to death, uh, even before Titus uh, uh, breaks through the, the city walls. The Christians have fled, uh, and you can imagine now, this leads to a further divide between the Jewish Messianic believers and those that didn't believe in Jesus. Those that didn't believe in Jesus and hear his words, they stayed, fight, defend our city, defend the temple. And there's those Christians that fled when we needed them the most. You can, you can see how that would create, create just a little bit of a rift. And, there, and that was already coming based on our, our teaching from Sunday morning. The whole issue of Acts 15, what do we do with these Gentiles coming into this very Jewish church? And so this divide uh, is really... Uh, exaggerated now because of what happens. Of course, uh, Jesus' prediction was really talking about something that would happen during the tribulation uh, because it's during the abomination that causes desolation. Now, it was observed historically by believers in the, uh, in the first century. It's going to happen once again literally to a remnant of Jews during the tribulation period. Halfway through, the Antichrist will set his image up uh, they're going to, and they are going to flee. They're not going to get caught up in idolatry again, and they're going to flee, and they're going to uh, get out of town. Fourth, Jesus' prediction includes the sign of his coming, the sign that will have great meaning for Israel. Verse 27 indicates the return of Jesus' earth will be sudden, like a stroke of lightning. In it, he will rescue his people. They'll see him. They'll recognize him as uh, his uh, Messiah. Uh, Zechariah 12, they will look upon uh uh, one they have pierced and mourned for him as one mourns for his only child. Uh, Micah says this is, in Micah 2.12, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant, that's our key phrase, the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. Uh, they shall make a loud noise because of so many people. Uh, the one who breaks open will come up before them. Uh, they will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. So, again, this uh, uh, event is part of what we call Armageddon, the return of Jesus Christ to planet Earth, which is not one single event, but several events that, that occur when Jesus Christ returns back to planet Earth. 
with us. Uh, again, if you read that passage, uh, Revelation 19, returns riding on a great white horse, and we're with him. So you might want to take a few riding lessons before you get to heaven uh, because we're coming back with him riding on, on horses. Uh, at the end, one last little thing here is the idea of the uh, uh, verse 28. Uh, for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now, the, the eagles flying here around the carcass is a picture of a carnage. Uh, it could be the result of uh, the great battle fought in, that we've got details of Rev in Revelation 19. But uh, another view of that, according to Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, the carcass is seen as a body in that of Israel, Micah 2.12 that I just read. The vultures or eagles are seen as being the Gentile nations coming against them as seen in Isaiah 34 and 63. Uh, and that will be the place of his second coming, which in Hebrew is Basra or in his Greek uh, Petra. And I know we've talked about this before, but get a little map here on the next slide. I'm willing to bet. Hey, there it is. Uh, so you can see Jerusalem, the little red dot up there, and the big dot uh, down there in southern Jordan, right on the border. That, uh, that is uh, Basra in the Hebrew, Petra uh, in, um, in Greek, uh, and that is where the remnant of Jews will flee to in order to escape execution uh, by the Antichrist. God will supernaturally care for them. God will supernaturally uh, protect them during that last three and a half period. Uh, that is the group of Jews that survive, uh, that are here on earth when Jesus returns to save them as they cry out and recognize him as the Messiah. As we saw last week, he said to them, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the recognition he's the Messiah. When they say that, not individually like Jews do today, but as a nation, as the remnant representing the nation there in Basra, Jesus returns to planet Earth. Again, so signs of the coming, uh, six different circumstances to look at uh, in verse 8, the key, a beginning of sorrows or birth pains. So these are signs that are going to increase in strength and increase in duration, uh, and that's what we seem to be seeing currently. Secondly, the predictions that lead to the sign that will be seen by everyone, there are three of them. Uh, Daniel's prediction is completed, uh, uh, the middle of the tribulation period. Jesus' uh, prediction uh, will bring great confusion to a future generation. We've got a little confusion already. And third, Jesus' prediction was for a current generation. Uh, again, they heard it, they received it. A hundred thousand of them will be spared, but at the same time, is uh, most applicable specifically to that future generation, the remnant of Jews that will be saved during the middle of the tribulation period. Okay, so that's where we're at. And uh, we'll continue uh, next week. Uh, he continues on. Uh, and even the third week is when we kind of get to the, uh, the rapture of the, of the church. And if you've got any questions, I'll just be up front. I, I won't... Uh, Take them now so I can kind of uh, close things off here. So why don't we uh, bow our heads. Father, we do thank you that um, we can study prophecy together, Lord. And we know that the prophecies of the past have all been 100% accurate. And we certainly believe that all the prophecies of the future will be accurate as well. Lord, and uh, help us to recognize that we're living in the end of the end times. Lord, these things will occur during the reign of the Antichrist. Uh, if we're seeing the precursor to these events, then we know that time is short. Uh, and that's the purpose that you've given them to us. Uh, that's the practical application, is that we'd be concerned about our country, we'd be concerned about the world, and our concern would be to get the gospel out to all those that we might be able to reach while we have the opportunity before you call us home uh, to be with yourself. Lord, so may we have our eyes on heaven uh, and be used you uh, to minister and bless uh, those here on earth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.